That being said, I'd like to now introduce this morning's speaker. Uh, we're really delighted that she is here uh, with us. Uh, her name is uh, Dr. Uh, Leah Price. Uh, she is the Spiegel Research Fellow at the Finkler Institute uh, of Holocaust Research at Bar Ilan University. Um, Dr. Price's dissertation dealt with the impact of the refugee problem in the city of Warsaw and in the ghetto in 1939 to 1942. And her MA thesis dealt with healthcare problems in the Lithuanian ghettos of Vilna, Kovno, and Shavli. Other fields of interest are research in daily life of East European Jews during World War II and personal writings of Jews during the Holocaust. Dr. Price has published 25 articles and reviews, edited sev seven books, five diaries and two memoirs, and her study, Displaced Persons at Home, Refugees in the Fabric of Jewish Life in Warsaw and the Warsaw Ghetto from September 1939 to July 1942 was published by Yad Vashem in uh, 2015. Dr. Price led a research project in the International Institute for Holocaust Research of Yad Vashem, Untold Stories, Murder Sites of Jews in the Former Soviet Union, and was editor-in-chief of the Hebrew online version of the Yad Vashem Encyclopedia of the Ghettos during the Holocaust and the Online uh, Holocaust Resources Center of Yad Vashem. Uh, in 2017, Dr. Price served as the historical advisor for the Warsaw Ghetto Exhibition at the Ghetto Fighters Museum. Uh, I'm really delighted that Dr. Price uh, is joining us today, and um, uh, I'm really excited about this topic. I think it really fits into what we're talking about, about uh, healthcare and social welfare in, um, uh, among the Jews uh, during the Holocaust. So I turn the floor over now to Dr. Price. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm speaking from Israel, and you will hear it if you haven't heard it. Uh, because of my accent and my English is very, very Israeli. I'm apologize. I, I apologize, but I'll try my best that you will understand me. Okay. My lecture will deal with the medical uh, problems that the Lithuanian Jews faced during the World War II or during the Nazi era. However, some words, a few background words about what is Lithuania, or, who are the Jews we are speaking about? So, just a moment. Let's see. Okay. Uh, between the two world war, wars, Lithuania was an independent state. Uh, however, part of it, this part, the green, this part, uh, the city of Vilna, Vilnus, and the environs. Uh, belonged uh, from 1920 to 1939 to Poland uh, and Kovna here, Kaunas Kovna, became the temporary capital of uh, Lithuania. Uh, but following the occupation of Poland and uh, by Nazi Germany and the non-aggression pact between uh, the Soviet Union and the Nazi Germany, which, which we call a Ribbentrop-Molotov uh, agreement, Vilna was re-annexed to Lithuania. But on June, June, in June 1940, Lithuania as entirely was annexed to the Soviet Union. What does it mean? All the Jewish uh, political, social, educational and cultural institutions were either closed or nationalized, including the, uh, the hospitals and the, the healthcare institutions. On June 19th, June 22nd, 1941, Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union, the Barossa operation, uh, Lithuania was the first to be occupied in about three, four days. It was in the hands, uh, Lithuania was in the hands of the, uh, of the Germans. Uh, and just immediately with the invasion, the Jewish population felt the policy of the new Nazi regime. It's not, uh, it's not only by the German itself, but by the national Lithuanian. Some of them were trained already in Nazi Germany. They were waiting for the Nazis to come to Lithuania. 
and in its uh, in between time until the German uh, were strong in 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 their rule in in Lithuania, they were um, carry they, they carried out pogroms all over uh, all over Lithuania and killed a lot of people until the uh, the German put an end of it. But this. Uh, uh, the, 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 the German policy was reflected in violent attacks even later on by the German. And the, when the, the Lithuanian um, attacked the Jews, it was under the auspices of the uh, German um, occupier. Uh, only a few weeks passed and the implementation of what we call the final solution of the Jewish question began. The final solution of the Jewish question began with the invasion of the Soviet Union. That's something we, we, that we have to remember. And since Lithuania was among the first, so the final solution of the Jewish question began in Lithuania, as a matter of fact. Uh, what does it mean? It means mass murder of Jewish women, Jewish men, Jewish children, and elderly. In the city, in the Stettlach, the small cities, the small, excuse me, the small towns in which Jews lived, eh, at least half of the, eh, of the population was, was Jewish. And in the main cities, in Kovna, in, in Ponyvesh, in, the, in the Vilna. Now I want to show you some, what does it mean, final solution? What does it mean, these attacks? It was filmed. A lot of such attacks were, were filmed, but only two, we can say survived, only, we found only two. I'll show you one of it. You, you see it, yes? Yes. Yes, okay. The picture were identified by Yad Vashem staff. Okay, the second one is from Lipaya, Latvia. Uh, since we are not dealing with, uh, with Latvia, I, I, I will not show you this one. It is more impressive, this one, but anyhow. The, what we saw now, we saw a Jewish men getting off a truck and being taken to the pits, and these pits were, as a matter of fact, their graves. Uh, it was shown in the Wochenschau. Wochenschau, how do you say it? It's, uh, it was screened in the, in, the, in the cinema in Germany uh, just after the invasion of uh, uh, the Soviet Union, showing the public how do we, our achievements in the front. So this was uh, shown, they didn't show that they killed them. We showed, they said, See what we are doing, we are taking Jews and now they are working. 
Jews are working now. That's what they said. But we know that all of them were killed and buried in the same place. Uh, at the beginning of December 1941, after the killings of about more, about 150,000 Jews in Lithuania, I didn't, I didn't say that uh, in the eve of uh, in 1941, we did, with uh, Vilna, there were 220,000 uh, Jews living in Lithuania. Uh, some of them were refugees from Poland who ran away and found refuge in Vilna, mostly in Vilna, but not only in Vilna. Uh, so uh, in, uh, when the German came and after the murder operation, the first one, the big one, they murdered about 150 Litu uh, 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 Jews and about 45, 43, 45,000 Jews were imprisoned in three ghettos. Vilna, about 17, 18,000, maybe more people at the, at the beginning. A Kovna, the same a number, and Shaulai, and Shavli, about 5,000. Um, let's see from the correspondence between uh, July and December uh, 1941, between the civilian administration, the German army, the Gestapo in this day, about on the Jewish question, it becomes clear that the murderous tendency of the SS on one hand, and the urgent needs of the army and civilian uh, administration for cheap and efficient labor, forced labor, eventually led to the setup of those three ghettos. They need some, they need Jews for work, they need manpower. That's the reason why they uh, set up those three ghettos. The commander of the Eisenhower Commando in the SS in Lithuania, Karl Jäger, who commanded the murder operation before, what wrote a report to his superior, to his commander, the commander of Einsatzgruppen A, Walter Stalecker. This was a very unusual report. In, he reports in details the extent, the extent of the murder of the Jews according to date, to place of the residence of the, those who were murdered, Vilna, such and such, uh, Ponivegis, Yurbarkas, uh, and so on, the place of, uh, and the number of the murder. How 150 Jewish children, 220 Jewish women, 315, that's only an example of Jewish men. That's day by day, day by day. He uh, 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 reported in details. And he also he wrote at the end of this report, I suppose, that's what he wrote, that after the winter, these forces will be urgently needed in the future as well. So we don't kill them because we need them in the meantime. So, what were the ghettos in Lithuania and also in other places as well as Lodz, but in Lithuania mainly a reservoir of Jewish slaves for the benefit of the German war effort. This was the reason, this was the raison d'etre of those ghettos. Uh, this was the demand of the German army, of the civilian administration, and the SS who didn't want it, they, they wanted to kill all of them, except it. It is important to emphasize, it's very, I think it's a very important note. That Germany, due to its many conquests in East Europe and West Europe and in the Balkan and so on, suffered from a shortage of manpower. And whenever local forces 
could be used, even if these were Jews, they did so. Therefore, the reason may be that we have some survivors of the, from the Holocaust. The murderous reality that the Jews witnessed made them realize quite quickly that the work and the benefit they would bring to the Germans gives them the chance to stay alive. This is our, this is, uh, in this lies our salvation, our redemption. That's what they believe in. And the Jewish leadership in the Lithuanian ghettos, see, this is also a, a report. Uh, <laughs> you see, this is a, a here you see a Lithuania with, I think, coffins, coffins. Leo, you're muted. Leo, you're muted. Now you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. So I'll show you again. Okay. Uh, well, well, yes. Uh, the Jewish leadership of the ghettos, Judenrette, in Lithuania's ghettos, in other ghettos as well, but mainly in Lithuania, understood this and believed in it as well, that if we will be beneficial, if we will be efficient, and if we will work, this will be our redemption. So the preservation of the Jewish working manpower and preserving their health was a key element in the struggle for survival. How did they did it? Uh, let's take uh, Vilna Ghetto as an example. Vilna Ghetto is an example uh, because we have a lot of materials regarding this matter more than other places, but we will focus on one place and we will understand, I think it, that Vilna Ghetto was the most interesting activities and um, in, in those three ghettos, but that's not the problem. The Vilna Ghetto was established in early September, 1941 in the old ghetto area of the city. The area was crowded with alleys with small streets, no reasonable uh, sanitary infrastructure or heating condition and no adequate water flow in the houses. Later on, they fixed it because there was a very good technical department in the ghetto and good engineers. But at the first, it was a very neglected and very poor neighborhood in the area where five to 6,000 people used to live, mostly Jews, more than 46,000 are now, are then crowded in two quarters, at the, at the beginning in two quarters of the ghetto. And this is after they killed already 10,000 in the, in the July, August, 10,000, uh, uh, they killed already, they were murdered, you know where they were murdered in the, a, a forest of Punar, it is 10 kilometer between um, um, Vilna and Grodno, uh, uh, 10 kilometers from, from Vilna. During the first four months of its existence, of the ghetto's existence, September, December 1941, the ghetto began to shrink both in the number of its inhabitants and in its territories, and from two quarters, it turns into one quarter. Uh, at the end of 1941, there were about 17,000 Jews. Not all of them were legal. Some were registered, some not, but most of them. 
uh, and the individual, the one, the individual, the person who was appointed to head the ghetto and, and was previously at the beginning, he was the commander of the Jewish police in Vilna. And later on, after a year in July 42, as, I, as, as much as I remember, he uh, was appointed to be the head of the Jürgen Rat. Was Jakob Gens, here you see him. Jakob Gens was not from Vilna. He went away to Vilna. He was born in Lithuania in a village near Shablin. He served as an officer in the Lithuanian army. That's not, uh, it's not very usual that the Jew is an officer in the Lithuanian army. But he was a soldier. He studied then after he was released, he, was, he studied at the University of Kaunas. He was a teacher in Jewish school, but he taught Lithuanian, the Lithuanian uh, language. Uh, and he was also with uh, Lithuanian uh, films later on. In 1940, when the Soviets get into Kovna, he, runs away, he went away because he was afraid, because he was a Lithuanian nationalist, he was afraid from the Soviets, so he went to a place where nobody knows him except his brother who lived there. And he got a, a position in the hospital, in a hospital, in a Jewish hospital in Vilna. Uh, and when the war broke out, the first thing, uh, he was, because he spoke very good Lithuanian and he spoke even German literature and he was a very strong man. He was just immediately nominated and he was a, an officer, a soldier. He, he immediately was appointed to be the head of the police, of the Jewish police. And because of his character, he became the the, the strongest person in the ghetto, and then later on he was appointed the head of the ghetto. As the head of the Judenrat, he understood well the importance, the importance of the exploitation of the Jewish labor force by the Germans. And, the, and the, therefore he believed in the policy of productivity as a means of survival. If we will work, we will be productive, we will survive. That was his policy. That is why he put huge attention to prophylactic activities and to a setup of an efficient and experienced uh, health department in, under, in the Judenrat, it was uh, under the, uh, responsibility of the Judenrat. Now, the first task of the Judenrat Health Department in Vilna, that was added by another member of the Judenrat, Chaptai Melkonovitsky, who was a lawyer, no doctor, was to organize an epidemiological sanitary department. Now we can see here, it's in Yiddish, that's the language they spoke in Vilna, also Polish, also Lithuanian, but mostly, mostly Yiddish. Here you see the, if somebody can, if there are some of you who understand Yiddish, you see the, the manpower of the epidemiological department. It is in the center because the sanitary condition in the ghetto were difficult. And in order to maintain an adequate a sanitary condition, the people who work there had to be very qualified and very experienced. Uh, and the Jews of the ghetto understood uh, uh, that guarding the ghetto uh, from epidemics, epidemics would prolong its life and give its inhabitants a chance to stay alive, to, to get through this terrible day. They wouldn't rat appointed 
דוקטור לזר אפשטיין, you see here his picture, his photo, as head of the epidemiological sanitary department in the ghetto, and he began operating immediately. Now, this man, the Dr. Epstein, was an experienced epidemiologist. He was not from Vilna. He came from Vilna, from, to Vilna from Kovno. He was sent by the Soviet already, before the war broke out, he was sent already by the Soviet to uh, cope with the epidemics that were in Vilna when the Soviet came. And, uh, He, he, he continued his job when the uh, ghetto was set up because he was an expert. A few days after the establishment of the ghetto, the department that he headed began an intensive operation of supervising health and cleanliness. To this end, now I'm going to, to, uh, to read a list. They established a labor companies and units supervising and units supervising the houses and rooms, a unit for exterminating insects, a unit for supervising the street and yards, a unit for removing garbage, disinfection uh, chambers uh, or what you call it cells for disinfection, bath houses. an isolation station that operated near the ghetto gate, and laundries and even uh, uh, um, sometimes the uh, hairdressers to cut the hair. In addition, the, the epidemiological department set up special station for treatment of scabias. You know what scabias is. It's a, a disease, a, a disease that uh, comes from, from uh, uh, dirt. Uh, and tuberculosis and open tea houses that provided hot water, hot water for home use. The number of employees in this part and this depart or this de department, the, the, the epidemiological department the ranges from 130 to 155. It's quite a lot. We are talking about 17,000 people. It's only one, one bunch in the uh, health uh, division. For uh, the purpose of tightening supervision, the ghetto was divided into areas. The areas were further divided into an internal division. At the head of each area was an administrator and an assistant, and they were joined by supervisors, especially sanitary workers whose job was to supervise the cleanliness of the streets, courtyards, toilets, and stairwells. Everything was under control, intensive control. They also monitor the cleanliness of the apartment and closely follow the instructions. Among the inhabitants of the building, they also nominated people who had to scan the, the, the apartment uh, and uh, to give report to a special body that was set up. It was uh, the sanitary police. There was a sanitary police. Then a sanitation police, as a matter of fact, the sanitation police was established to enforce the supervision on cleanliness and sanitation and had punitive authorities. They gave, they punished, even sometimes they put people in the local jail in the ghetto because they, they, they were very, very dirty and it was very dangerous. The sanitary department play, paid uh, close attention to the question of personal cleanliness also, and engage all ghetto residents in the fight against lice and insect carrying. More than once, an educational institution, institution or a school or library were closed, was closed due to the fear that it had become a focus for the spread of diseases. 
הרמן קרוק, if you heard about the name, הרמן קרוק was the chronic, the, the chronic writer of the ghetto, he was Polish, a bund, a member of the bund, and he wrote in his diary, a diary, a very important one, uh, it was also uh, published in, in, translated into English, but he wrote it in Yiddish, and he was very, very set uh, up, uh, um, uh, very uh, mad about it, um, uh, Epstein because he closed his library. And uh, Epstein closed the library because it was dangerous. It was, uh, he was, uh, he sus- it was a, a, for a, a place of insects and so on. Uh, preventing infectious diseases and epidemics and especially hide the information about it from being spread was also one of the things that the ghetto had and the heads of the health department took great care of, not to spread information about what is going on in the hospitals. This information should remain classified. Why? Because in the Kovna ghetto, innocently and maybe out of fear, just after the setup of the, uh, of the ghetto, they uh, set up a, a special hospital for uh, infectious diseases. So in October 1941, at the end of October 1941, the German came, burned the hospital, with it, all its patients and all the staff burnt. And this information, this tragic event was, <laughs> been, was spread all over Lithuania and even in Poland, I think. And uh, so it was very important for them to understand that have, they have to prevent diseases, but also to hide the information about the nature of the diseases. Even Jews shouldn't know about it, but because somebody can talk something. At the initiative of the department, the technical unit in the ghetto built two baths that served as a transit and inspection station. In the ghetto newspaper, you know that the ghetto uh, published a, a ghetto newspaper, Ghetto Yedies, the news of the ghetto. The residents were informed of the dates of the opening of the bathhouses. And every resident of the ghetto must bath at least once a month. Here it was written in Yiddish. You have to do, you have to go once a month. Because you know there were no baths in, 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 the, in most of the... Uh, the in apartments there. The sanctions for those who didn't fulfill the order was the cancellation of the monthly food card distributed to the residents. Here you see Gens, you see here, that's Gens' signature. He warned them second time, people are not going to bath, people are dirty. You have to Keep to, to keep your body clean. The, however, or indeed, the strict and constant supervision of the sanitary epidemiological department has given results. The reports published by the statistical department, they have also a statistical department in the Vilna Ghetto, show that over time there has been a reduction in the number of the dirty apartment yards and streets. You know that the German used to go there. The German used to come to visit the ghetto. They didn't get in the house, the, the apartment, the, the, the houses, but they, so they visited the streets and the public uh, locations. So uh, it, it was very, uh, every time the Germans went away and they didn't have anything to say, it was a, a kind of, uh, of relax. 
The ghetto population responds to this uh, strict sanitary supervision and monitoring of, uh, of, uh, of and the monitoring was mixed. Not all the people, uh, you understand that it was very, very strict and not very easy to, um, to be supervised. Uh, Ruth Lehmann's on Engelstern, one of uh, the survivors, uh, survivors of, uh, of Wilna Ghetto that was in hiding in, the, uh, uh, in 1944, wrote her uh, memoirs and, um, and even a diary. She, she says that every day the person in charge of the block appeared to check the order in the apartments several times a week, the sanitizer came. Okay. From time to time, an entire committee came. Uh, but she says that's what that, that it was. There was no other. Uh, there was no other choice. But another employee of the health department noted in his memoir that the supervision work didn't go easily, didn't go smoothly. And the, the adaptation of to the new reality in the ghetto was forced on the Jews, led to many friction, many quarrels, many uh, the conflicts. Um, Le Leah, Le 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 can you just speak a little bit closer to the the microphone? Thank you. Ah, you don't hear me. Oh. Sometimes you're a little soft, it, so it thank you. That, uh, yes, I know that's a problem. <laughs> the fear of epidemics. The hatred of the Germans and the strong desire to live and survive the difficult times overcame all the, diff all the conflicts and so on. And people fulfilled the, the, the orders. Uh, that is why, because that is why it was very um, um, important uh, to, uh, how do I say it? to carry on contact with the public on health issues. It was very vital to a campaign of explanation. In the city of Vilna, a Jewish health magazine called Volksgesund, it's uh, the health of the, of the people, was published. It was published before the war. That was the way that the doctors, the Jewish doctors, were in touch with, with the public, with the Jewish public, with the Jewish people. The ghetto doctors continued to publish it even during the ghetto period. Part of it was a printed edition, but mostly it was a live stage. In the theater of the ghetto, there was, it still exists, as a matter of fact. People, mainly women, came and listened to lectures given by the doctors about any, let's folks in the Zoom team, you will see here, the, the subject, all kinds of topics uh, that was very relevant to their life. Uh, and keep, people came to hear and learn about various diseases and how to deal with it because information was extremely important. One of the interesting phenomena that touches also, I think, I think our lives of today is the question of vaccines. In order to avoid infection on the one hand and to continue to exploit the Jewish labor force on the other hand, the German authorities supplied vaccine doses against typhoid fever to the ghetto residents. It was a very special uh, incident. It was not, you cannot find it in many ghettos. The vaccine was not given to all the ghetto residents, but only to those who worked with the Germans to those who worked with children and youth, but not to the children and the youth, they didn't get it. And to those who worked with food, but it's quite a number. The number of legal residents in the ghetto was 16, 17,000. Only 11,800 were, uh, were, uh, could uh, get the vaccines. 
How is there? The percentage of actual vaccinated from February to May 1942 was 26%. The, ma the majority didn't get vaccine, didn't want to get vaccine. Indeed, not everyone who was eligible to get vaccinated did so. People avoided vaccination. Why? Because the vaccine refusal, you know, vaccine refusal are in part anxious people. I don't know how to say it in English. They are, but in this case, people refused to trust the injection given to them by the Germans even if the vaccinators were Jewish. The refusal to get vaccinated indicated a lack of trust in the authority. And also personal anxiety. So what are we doing? What the doctors, the ghetto doctors, understood the importance of the vaccine and came out with an information campaign to encourage vaccination. Here you see in this false gesund, number two, Dr. Shumeliski, Boich typhus, typhoid, it is a, a typhoid fever, and the injection against typhus. And he explained them why it is important to get this injection. Uh, here we see, here, it was um, published in the ghetto, Achtung, attention. And I'm reading what is written here. I translated it into English. The epidemiological sanitary department is carrying out free, free. The free is written on this, yes, with bold letters carrying out free injections against typhoid fever to prevent diseases. With the coming spring, the danger of spreading contagious diseases is growing. Everyone has the obligation, the chav, chav, the obligation to prevent it. Keep yourself and your family safe and go and get the vaccine in Rudnitsky Street 7 from the town. Another, uh, in the false result, yes, this was published in the false result. Here we see Dr. Gelman, scholarly lecture in the false result uh, that explains in details what is a vaccine. What, and why people should be vaccinated. It's uh, here we see, it's, it's a long lecture, not, not long as mine, but it's a long lecture uh, explaining all, all the shortcomings, everything that a, a person is asking about the vaccination. I cannot tell you if this campaign succeeded or not. I don't have the information. Uh, but I want to show you how uh, they were so, uh, it was so important to, to, uh, to keep those uh, workers safe and to vaccinate them. Uh, the vigilance of cleanliness and health was also reflected in the low mortality. This is, this is what was important. What is the bottom line? The bottom line is, the low mortality and morbidity rates in the Vilna, Vilna ghetto and all over the ghetto, in, in other ghettos of Lithuania as well. The rate of mortality was low, not like, unlike Warsaw, no, you can compare even Warsaw and Lodge and so on. Uh, reports written by members of the UNUA Health Department show that in the first month of the ghetto's existence, especially during the winter time, winter season, the annual mortality rate was three deaths per thousand. Three for me. It's low. But 
over time, there has been a decline in this number as well of death. At the same time, it should be borne in mind that in addition to the intensive preventing activity measures that the ghetto population, that, that were put on, the ghetto population was largely young and relatively immune to diseases. This is also a, something you have to take into consideration. A, the day of the, uh, uh, Paul, you will uh, stop me when uh, time will. Well, we probably you should. So, 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 Leah, we should, Dr. Price, we should probably break soon so we give people a chance to ask questions. Okay, I just want something, not everything. Uh, only one, and then uh, to sum up, the deputy director of the Vilna Ghetto. This is the deputy, Dr. Avram, Dr. Abrash Abraham. And this is Mark Dvorzhetsky. He was a, a doctor, worked with uh, Epstein, and also a historian. After the war, he was an historian in the Barilan University. Uh, here, both of them are uh, just released from the concentration camp. Uh, Dr. Weinreb described in his memoirs the dilemmas that face that the doctors face in the ghetto. One of the best known is the insulin dilemma, when the number of insulin doses is limited. Whom to give? For young people, on those who have the chance to survive, to live, to stay alive, or for everyone, without any difference. What to do? And this was on the agenda of rabbis and doctors, and the rabbi said that one should not be preferred over the other. You have to give it to anybody, to everybody, as much as you have. However, the doctors made a more rational consideration and give those who had the chance to survive. But uh, Dr. Weinreb himself said that it doesn't matter. Most, bo both of them didn't survive. Uh, another topic I'm not going to uh, elaborate because we are short in time was the prohibition of uh, giving birth to children in, in Vilna ghetto and in other Lithuanian ghetto, but this is a, a, special, um, a special topic that we are not going to, uh, that we, I don't have time. I just want to sum up. In his study, in his study of the institution of the Yudorat, the historian Ishayao Trunk, refer to the informed and efficient activity of the health department in Vilna Ghetto. And he wrote in his book, Yudmat, the high level that characterized its work, the great dedication to the public and the high level of expertise of its employees protected the population from the spread of dangerous epidemics. That's true. Most of them didn't survive, but not because they were sick. And one more conclusion, if I may, when we discuss and investigate the fate of the Jews in the Holocaust, there is a feeling that we are dealing with an issue that is a bit out of history, a kind of time capsule detached from time and place and regardless of what happened before and after. But what is clear, on many issues, and especially in the field of public health life, is that despite the different times, and thank God, despite the, the reality and condition that has changed, there are things that are, that are as they were then, and there is nothing new under the sun. Thank you, and the floor is open for questions. So thank you very much, uh, 
Dr. Price. That was a fascinating uh, presentation. Um, maybe you could uh, uh, stop the screen share so we could see people and we could see you better. Um, I'd like to invite people now to, to present. We have a few minutes and we could go. We have a few minutes, so I think we should take some questions. Um, you know, uh, I was I was wondering one question, actually, while and I'll pose this while we're waiting for people to pose their own questions. And that is, um, well, first of all, thank you so much for a fascinating presentation. Really, I learned so much today. Um, what was the what was the story with food? So they were very careful to to keep things clean and to keep people healthy. But obviously, food is an important part. And um, you know, yesterday Sam Casso talked about the smuggling in the Warsaw ghetto and in the Lodge ghetto, how things were hermetically sealed. What was the story in the Vilna ghetto? Hey, I tell you, in Vilna ghetto and in the, in the Lithuanian ghetto, there was not there was not like in uh, in Warsaw and Lodge, uh, there was not uh, you know a uh, hunger. There was no hunger. It's not, but you have to remember that in the Lithuanian ghetto, most of the workers went out of the ghetto. They worked in warehouses, in the, uh, in the airfields, in the place, in the factories outside the ghetto. They got in contact, they got contact with the Lithuanian, and there was a barter. They were barter. So they put inside the ghetto a lot of materials that they smuggled. And they barbed, they barbed the, the, the police. They give something to the police. And they put in the ghetto a lot of things that they bought from outside the ghetto. This was the, the oxygen of the ghetto, the fact that they could go outside and bring and make some barter, they, something they had in the ghetto, even uh, medicines, medicines. Also, they uh, formed the ghetto. Sometimes the German came to the Kovno ghetto to get medicines because in the town you, they couldn't find. So this was a, a real, um, I don't see you. I'm here. I hear you. I don't see you. I don't see you. Maybe. Okay. And I, uh, Dr. Price, if you look along the bottom of your screen, if you see something that says Zoom meeting, click on that. Yeah, we see, we see you though. You see me? Yes, yes, okay. and we hear you. Okay, but I don't see you. Okay, <laughs> all right. Okay, you can ask me questions. Ah, yes, okay. So this is the, 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 the question about food. There, is, there was no hunger in those ghettos. You cannot say that was a lot of food, but people didn't... Uh, die of hunger. So thank you. The thank German you. needed them. The German needed them. It was a forced labor. It was, they need the, 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 this manpower. So they give them even vaccines. So they tried very hard to keep this manpower alive. No, no thank you. Um, I have a lot of follow-up questions, but I have questions from the participants, so I want to I want to share those with you. Okay, uh, one of the questions is that you said in I believe in October 1941 that the Germans burned down the hospital, I believe in Kovno, um, and that was a little bit yes. unclear. Do you, could you just a, a, explicate that a little bit? Explain that a little bit. In Kovno, they set up a special hospital for infectious diseases. It was innocent how no, think that they, they were a, a hospital for usual uh, 
uh, patient and those who have dangerous diseases, they set up a special uh, hospital in the edge of the ghetto. That's something that shouldn't be done because the Germans were so afraid of such things. So in October, it didn't take long because the ghetto was set up in, in August, September. In October, the end of October, they came and they burnt, burnt the hospital with the staff, with the, uh, the patient, burnt. It was a shocking event. So they, so the Germans were just how many? I don't know how many, how many, but you can, if you are interested in it, you can read it in the in what is it was written about Kovna Kaunas Kovno Ghetto. Right. Uh, they so, mentioned it. it. Was a little bit before the great uh, action, uh, the great uh, uh, the so, great action. In, Yes. So the Germans burned it just because it had the name for uh, infectious diseases and that scared them? Yes, yes, yes. Because right. they were afraid. Everything, you know, every, the, the, the fear, the German fear from epidemics. In Bronzo, they, <laughs> they wrote that they, there were uh, shields written, notes written. This is an... A, a, a special region, a infectious region, don't get in. They are afraid, they believe that the Jews are carrying something, uh, they are carrying viruses, uh, uh, um, um, infectious viruses. They themselves are immune, are immune. that's what they, th they, they spoke, they, they, they believed but they are spreading it uh, to the others. So we have to be very, very careful uh, with, uh, with the Jews and with their diseases. The Jews are very dangerous. They are insect carriers and so on and so on. That's their uh, prejudice. Right, right. No, thank you. Um, I, have a, I have a few more questions and um, Right now it's 11 o'clock. I, I propose since we went a little bit late that we go five more minutes and then we'll call a break. Is that okay with everybody? Yes, is everybody okay with that? Okay, because this is, it's, I think it's fascinating. Okay, so just a, maybe a couple more questions. So one of the questions is that you had mentioned that the Nazis had tried to stop the Lithuanians when they were doing the pogroms against the Jews. Can you, can you explain that? The Nazis wanted everything to be in order. It began to be the, the, the Lithuanian. Uh, it was vandalism. It was uh, uh, at the, I, I, I say that another way. The Lithuanian cooperated with the Germans because they believed that in, one month, two months, they will get independence from the Nazis. The elite will be independent. The, the Nazis, the German, the Germany will give them independence. That was a team. And they, they began to, uh, to do whatever they want with the, with the Jews. And this was this is a way that the Germans didn't like. They wanted to control, not the, 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 the whatever they want. We will do it our way. At first, until they became the, the, the rule, the regime, the Nazi regime became steady, yes? So, the Lithuanian did what they wanted, but it didn't take long until the Germans said, we are here, the rulers, we are, we are here in control, you can't do whatever you want. However, do you, they use them later on 
for their uh, murder operations. Usually a German went and 20 or 10 uh, the, 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 the work. Uh, because as I told you, there were not enough men, German um, uh, manpower in the, uh, in the occupied territories. So they used wherever is possible. And the Lithuanian, at least at the beginning, were, were very enthusiastic uh, cooperators. But they cannot, the German will not give them the the, the, uh, the ability to do whatever they want. We are in control here. If you want to kill Jews, we will kill the Jews. You will, but under our control, not you will do whatever you want. Somebody is in, somebody is in control here and not the Lithuanian. They were very disappointed from this, the Lithuanian from this attitude, because they were, they thought that the German, the German will give them independence and they can do whatever they want, but it didn't, it didn't come to. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, th I think we're, we're out of time at this point, but I want to thank you for a fantastic presentation. Like I say, I learned a lot and I, I believe that everybody else did as well. If we have further questions, can we, can, can, I, I can I yes. email you? I can I send you the questions if I get if we yes, get more? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, thank you. We'll do. Yes. And 